Okay, well, I'm Dottie Woodson. I'm the rainwater harvesting specialist and irrigation specialist for urban areas in the state of Texas through Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. I'm assigned, my office is at the Dallas Research and Extension Center. We have 12 research and extension centers in the state of Texas in a county office in almost every single county. So we've got a lot of extension employees that go out and do a lot of good programming. So I'm going to be speaking to you today about um, rainwater capture and commercial locations. The first picture I'm showing you is in Denton County. The county of Denton needed some new offices and they're going to be building and adding to this large office building and they decided they wanted to do all the right stuff for rainwater capture and for stormwater mitigation. And so in this picture you see one of the four or five thousand gallon cisterns that they set up to catch all the stormwater and release it out as irrigation water into their landscape and also to um, as a stormwater mitigation if they don't use all the water in the cisterns then they slowly release it into the rain garden that they have for uh, for capture and so okay I'm all of a sudden not knowing how to forward the Mung Mung are you still there Pushing my forward buttons, not forwarding the um, slides. So, uh, try uh, try simply click right here. No, that's what right about here. page down? Page down. Yeah, I tried that. I page tried page forward. Okay. Um, Oh, here we go. Okay, so rainwater capture, when we think about our water resources using groundwater or surface water and our municipalities using one or the other or both, you know, that's what we're using now for irrigation. And of course, that costs a lot of money to clean that water through the water treatment plant to make it safe to drink, but at the same time, we're using it for irrigation. How crazy is that when our plants would much, much rather have rainwater in most areas? So when we look at alternative water for irrigation, rainwater harvesting is one of the number ones we look at because of the easy way and affordability of setting that up. Gray water is being looked at a lot, but still the plumbing codes would have to change to make that more affordable. And then air conditioner condensate is the other one everyone's looking at. Again, that's a very affordable thing to do in some cases, but again, some of the plumbing codes um, have to change because right now it says all condensate from air conditioners has to go in the wastewater lines. And then recycled water is water provided by your municipality through their wastewater uh, treatment plant, and that's a, that's a big deal in order to do that. It's a lot of infrastructure that you have to put in, and some cities like San Antonio is, are doing that, and the city of Fort Worth is doing that. So what is rainwater harvesting? It's a capture, diversion, and storage, and distribution of rainwater for later use, mainly right now for irrigation. It reduces the demand on the municipal water supply, and so if a significant amount of people do that, that's going to be a win-win situation for the municipal water supply. In some cases, the municipal water um, you know, supply, because of our large, large growth and population, are, are not being able to keep up with that supply that's needed, and they're going to have to spend millions and millions of dollars adding on to their water treatment and wastewater treatment to meet the needs of the growing population. But we also want to think of it as a stormwater mitigation, so it reduces flooding, erosion, and contamination of our surface water. And so in an area where you have a very, very high stormwater charge for all your impervious pavement, this is one of the selling points of a rainwater capture system. So you're going to be capturing the water off of the building, off of the parking lot, and therefore every impervious surface that you're now being charged a stormwater fee for, you can maybe deal with your municipality and say, look, we're capturing all that stormwater and slowly releasing it in irrigation or slowly releasing it into a rain garden, slowly releasing it into the storm drain and not causing the problem with stormwater that is normally caused by water um, running very, very quickly off of our impervious surfaces carrying all kinds of pollution, you know, the dust and fertilizer and soil erosion and off of our parking lot, of course, trash, oil, um, rubber tire debris that is left there on the parking lot. 
So mainly we talk about using you know, rainwater for irrigation and landscapes and gardens and of course in greenhouse. The green industry is loving rainwater capture because a lot of times the municipal water has so much chlorine in it and so much calcium in it, it is not as usable. I mean not as aesthetically pleasing as you know, rainwater capture can be. Um, for pet watering outdoors, for livestock watering, for wildlife watering, firefighting, and then for indoor use, both for non-potable reason like flushing toilets and for potable uses. And so rainwater capture, what are the requirements for this? And of course, mainly it's a catchment area, and that can be a roof or a parking lot. We need a conveyance of downspouts and gutters to take the water into the cistern, either above ground or below ground. And then we need a storage tank, either above ground or below ground. And we need to size that storage tank depending on how much water we're intending to capture off our impervious surfaces and how much we need for irrigation. Treatment, we want to filter the water going into the cistern, and we want to filter the water coming out of the cistern. And then, of course, for distribution, we recommend drip irrigation because this is the most efficient way to irrigate in our area. And we'll discuss more of that. So rainwater capture, what can we do? For every square foot of impervious surface in a one-inch rain, you can collect 0.623 gallons of water. So in a 10,000 square foot parking lot, 10,000 square foot office building, you can collect in a one-inch rain. Oh, I didn't change that figure. Well, it comes out to uh, a lot of water <laughs> and then in a uh, 12,000 gallons times 32 and a rainfall year you're going to collect um, 36. And so I will change that before uh, Mung Mung posts this. I'm sorry Mung Mung, I messed that up um, copy and pasting this. And so you can see we have two different kinds of commercial rainwater capture here. One looks like a parking garage but is actually a parking garage where they have sealed the concrete so thoroughly so the line won't go into the lard, into the rainwater and they capture all the rainwater. This is in Seattle, Washington. This is a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation there. And the city of Seattle at first didn't approve their building of their big you know, structure that they wanted to build because of stormwater issues in the Seattle area. They get so much rainfall a year, they have a lot of stormwater problems. And so this can collect about a million gallons of stormwater, and then they can slowly release it out into the landscape through irrigation, and then they have a couple of water fountains, you know, that they have on their property. On the other side, it's a large, large car dealership, and these cisterns are being, their fiberglass cisterns, being put underground in order to catch all the stormwater off of all the impervious surfaces there. Then we have to size a system by what we can collect, but also by what our plants need, and we figured that out by the plant water requirements, the evapotranspiration rate in our area, the irrigated area in square feet, the number of plants involved, the stage growth of the plants, and the time of year. I say the stage growth of the plants because when a plant landscape is brand new, it needs a little tiny bit more irrigation than it does once it's established. And of course, we recommend native and adapted plants that require less water, less pesticides, less fertilizer. This is a picture of a Starbucks, and it is in the Austin area, and you can see what they've done here. They're collecting all the water off of their building. They're not collecting it off the parking lot, and so they still have you know, some storm water leaving you know, the site. They've put in a water conserving landscape right here and so wow, what a win-win situation for their irrigation processes in the city not having to increase their water supply going through their rainwater, I mean through their water treatment plant for that irrigation water. Here in the state of Texas, everyone has to report the water that, that goes through their water treatment plant and how the water is used to the Texas Water Development Board. And I hate to tell you, the water increase during the irrigation season can be as high as 35%, but unfortunately as high as 70%. Two cities here in the state of Texas reported over 75% increase during the irrigation season. And so that city has to clean that much more water to do that. And that's why we're talking mainly about stormwater collection for irrigation. 
Over here we have a wonderful display of the Lower Colorado River authorities where they're capturing all the water off their wonderful interpretation and education center they've set up in Austin. And then right here we're looking at a large, large parking garage that was built at the Texas Tech campus. Large, large parking lot, mainly for the campus, but also for the huge, huge number that come to their athletic events, mainly football. <laughs> and so they're collecting the stormwater off of that, using it for irrigation. Here you can see a, a ground view of it after the landscape has been installed. So we want to think of what kind of number of gallons are we going to collect, how are we going to distribute it, and then do we want polyethylene, you know, fiberglass, wood, concrete, metal, underground or above ground. And of course, if we do it above ground, we want it opaque so that algae will not grow in the tanks. Underground, the main cost of underground storage is not the tank itself, not the containers, but the excavation of the soil out of there and then hauling the extra soil that can't go back in the hole um, away from the site. So that's a very, very costly thing. So here we see where someone is using a fiberglass tank. That's a 10,000 gallon fiberglass tank, I believe. And then over here we're using poly um, storm chambers that are all hooked together in a row and a great, great way to um, store your rainwater till, till you need it. And so we're going to look at another method. This is a um, modular method and you don't have to dig quite as deep. And this is a great way to put the stormwater collection under a parking lot or under an athletic field, under a big, big green space that you might have on the site where you're thinking about capturing rainwater. You use a submergible pump inside here, a lot of filtration, and pump it out in, into your irrigation. So pre-filtering, you know, as the stormwater comes into your tank, we want to think about what size we need, the volume of water that's going to come through here, and also what will be coming under here. Do you have a lot of trees? Are there going to be a lot of leaves involved? Or is it just going to be dust? animal droppings, bird droppings off your roof. It depends on what material your roof is made out of. Are we going to have some roof material going through there? So the sizing of this, whether you need a small, small, small situation like this um, to get that water pre-treated before, or a very, very, very large system. This is like the one in, in back of me, and this can be, you know, this can be um, six, um, you know, inches wide or it could be 12 inches wide. The company makes it for very, very large systems. This is another method. And you can see those large pipes going in and out of this filter for a very, very large underground system. And so we have to decide on that filtration and what we want to use, the water coming in, you know, all the debris being captured, and then of course we have to get rid of that water um, and that waste that is coming out of there, the debris. Other components we want to think about is a calming inlet going into taking the water into your cistern, whether it's above ground or underground. And what that does, it does not disturb the little bit of you know, debris that's going to get there, mainly sediments, dust, and things like that that's going to get through there. We don't want to disturb that, reintroduce that into the water. So that's what that calming inlet is about. And then this is a siphon overflow, so when we have to get some rid of some of the water because our tank's about to overflow, this siphons all the surface water off, so if any floating debris is there, any oil components from the parking lot or the roof or is on there, that will suck that off of there and take it off, that skims that off of there. And then right here, what we have inside our tank is what we call a floating intake. And so you can see the floating intake also has a filter in it. It holds the water six to four inches, depending on the size of your float ball, you know, from the surface. So you're not collecting any of floating debris or, or oil, you know, products that might be floating on the top. Very, very important to look at doing that. Again, as much filtration as we can do into our system. And then here is an irrigation filter. These come in many, many different sizes, depending on how much water is going to go through your irrigation pump. You want to filter that water before it goes through the pump because you want that water as clean as possible. 
Um, then also, all drip irrigation manufacturers recommend that you have a filter and use less pressure than a normal irrigation system through the system. So this is what would be in the valve box. You know, the valve needs regular pressure, but of course a drip irrigation needs to be filtered, and then it needs a pressure regulator to bring that down. And so that's what would be in, in your valve box. And so when we look at that, so we need a pump, we need a filter, above ground, below ground, and then we need to protect that equipment. Now I will share with you, since the industry, it's getting so popular to do rainwater capture, um, there are businesses out there that will custom build, you know, whatever your project requires for you, bring it to you on a skid, um, factory tested um, with a warranty, you know, easy installation. All you're going to be doing is hooking up your water in, your water going out. That's all you're going to do. So it's very, very, very nice to be able to do that and get the exact size you need and they will help you with all the mathematical formulas for what size pump, what size pressure tank, you know, what size filtration do you need and it's all right there on a skid. If you want a potable water system, they will also be adding a UV light to sterilize or sanitize the water or a chlorine injector or a ozone injector, believe it or not, so that can be added. So what is in the tank? And so here's the calming inlet. In this case, I had the artist draw one where I've just used PVC pipe to do it because I had him draw this before the industry got so huge and got interested in having that um, mechanical storming inlet. Then you can see my floating intake with a filter. Um, you can see my overflow. And then, of course, if we're going underground, we have to understand the inspection port has to be a certain um, up above the ground, and sometimes we have to add extensions because of that for, for safety reasons, because we don't want any storm water going into your underground system. And, of course, then we need an air vent. And this is our siphoning overflow. So. The biggest, biggest thing that I see people miss when they're pricing their um, rainwater collection system is the maintenance of it. it. The best, best, best thing you can do is contract a professional rainwater harvesting inspector specialist. These are a certification that you can get from the American Rainwater Catchment System Association where you're trained, you take a class, and this is a class we were holding here in Dallas, and so I have ladders out and every one of the class members is going to go to a different demonstration that we have here on site, active demonstrations, and go through the whole inspection process. Then, if, you, if the business is huge, huge, huge and have facility maintenance crew on site, you also might want to train them or you might want them to become a rainwater harvesting inspector specialist through taking the class and the exams and getting that certification. You mainly, you have to keep the gutters and downspout clean, the filters clean, you have to check for leaks, you have to check the pump, you have to protect the pump from freezing and also from sunlight. So there's quite a bit to do in order to assure yourself that your system is going to work like you're advertising it or selling it, so to speak, to work. Here in Texas, we have several different areas where you need to look at the rules and regulations for rainwater capture because the state of Texas wants to encourage rainwater capture and so we have a lot of homeowners wanting to install these or have professionals install these at their homes in order to save on their water bill, particularly during the irrigation season. And so there are, is legislation to say homeowners associations need to cooperate with rainwater capture and with drip irrigation and with putting in water efficient landscapes. So I want to talk about a case study so that you know what you need to be doing when you go and approach someone to do this commercially. So this is in West Virginia and it's a regional jail. The people in the different counties that were going to be using the jail, Franklin County, Montgomery County, Roanoke, and the city of Salem, wanted a large capacity for 605 inmates. They wanted to seek LEED certification, and they wanted to use what we call a siphon at um, roof drainage system, and so this is going to collect every drop of water that falls on that roof. And so here's the jail being built, and of course you want to approach anyone um, as uh, the 
plans, the architectural plans are being made because the infrastructure they might want to do for stormwater control might be different in order to do rainwater capture either above ground or below ground. So you want to get in at the architectural plan point of this and, and also the, having that commitment um, for doing the right thing with stormwater and then check with the municipality that may be charging the building and the parking lot for stormwater discharge. Because sometimes you can negotiate that we're not going to pay for the stormwater discharge anymore, we're not going to have that fee in order to save money that way. And so this case study, they determine how much water they could capture, they determine how much landscaping they need to put in, and so they're going to go underground like that, underground with the rainwater capture storage devices. These are fiberglass tanks. And now notice they haven't extended those inspection ports yet, but they will when they get the final infrastructure in to hold those tanks down. They're going to need an air release valve also, and we need to have all of that in place. So here's the payback analysis in order to sell this rainwater uh, capture system. The total cost was going to be you know, 258000 um, they were going to collect 3.9 million gallons of water through the system, and that means that they weren't going to be buying that water um, from the water provider, the local water provider. Now, if they looked at the current rate of water at that time, it's $3 per thousand gallons, and so an annual saving of 11000 you know, dollars, and then the payback time is going to be about 22 years. But what I want to explain to you is that's not the good picture that you want to represent. So what is the total, total payback analysis should include? And in this case, they're going to look at rainwater harvesting, you know, as a benefit for stormwater, for bioretention in an area that would cost about $240,000 when we're looking at it that way, and then we also have to look at the increased rate of the water in a 20-year period. So say the water rate increase goes up 40%, I mean, not 40%, oh, oh heaven forbid, 4% a year, and then we need to look at that. It will more than double, you know, the charge that the, the idea that we're going to save this much water, we're going to save this much money. And so if we look at that chart and, you know, we see this long, 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 long payback period, and then we add the stormwater savings and we add the increase of the price of water, therefore more money savings that way, and then you're going to see that the payback period is going to be much, 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 much shorter. And so this is the type of presentation you need to make to your customers when they're thinking about doing this. The other thing we have to look at about stormwater, and depending on your location where you're going to be doing this, we're going to look at salt-free water, whereas if we're going to look at groundwater and surface water, we've got some salt issues here in the state of Texas. It's all sales tax exempt here in the state of Texas. Um, you're going to look at reducing the water bill. You're going to look at reducing the electric bill, reduce the demand on the water treatment plant. You're also going to look at reducing the stormwater you know, charge that you're going to be being charged, and then of course that you're going to re be reducing erosion off of off of that area. So then we here in the state of Texas have a rule, a legislative rule, that if you build a building, a state building, and that means any state building, and that means on the Texas A&M campus, you're going to have to collect the storm water off of it, and you're going to have to store it and then apply it as irrigation. In this case, this drawing is showing also not just collecting storm water, that's what the blue line represents, but it also is collecting the air conditioner condensate off of the building in order to have even more water in the storage. Again, you match that rainwater capture to the irrigation needs on the site. You want to remember that you don't necessarily, if you can collect 100,000 gallons, you don't need a 100,000 gal 100, gallon storage system. You need to find out how much water you're going to be taking out there every month for irrigation. 
Now, why drip irrigation? Why am I recommending that as a distribution? Mainly, I'm recommending that because it is one of the most efficient methods that we can irrigate. Works under very, very low pressure. Distribution uniformity is much, much better with drip irrigation. The equipment's easily available in many cases. It's exempt from water restriction. It reduces the loss of water to evaporation and, and the water loss due to runoff. It re reduces leaching of water under the root zone and it can save money and water in the long run. So the benefits of drip irrigation is that you can match the application rate from your irrigation to your soil's infiltration percolation. It's very, very important that we understand that. We have very, very heavy clay soil, and that clay soil does not absorb water as fast as the rain comes down sometimes, and also as irrigation water is supplied. So look at this landscape right here, and you can see it's a very, very narrow landscape. It has stucco on the wall here, and you can see a beautiful sidewalk and infrastructure. If we put in a mist system, I mean a regular sprinkler system where mist comes out or sprinkler comes out, uh, what's going to happen to that wall? It will deteriorate very, very, very quickly because we don't have a you know, sprinkler systems we can put in except drip irrigation for a narrow area like that. Also, we might have some overspray on the sidewalk causing pedestrian hazard and also the deterioration of the sidewalk. So we need to look, we need to analyze that situation. But here's what you need to look at, and this is the biggest selling point for drip irrigation. What we have here is, depending on the slope, we have an infiltration percolation rate in clay soil, 0.1 to 0.4 inches an hour. A sprinkler system using spray irrigation um, emitters is going to put water out at 0.6 inches a minute, I mean 6 inches an hour, that's a percolation rate, to 0.7 to 0.8 to 0.9, and it's going to put water out faster than the ground can absorb it, and unfortunately that's what causes runoff on our heavy, heavy clay soils. Of course, as we play and work on our heavy clay soils, they also get very, very compacted, and so there needs to be a method where we can rejuvenate that compacted soil by aerating, um, adding compost to it after the aeration is done so the compost will go down in the aeration holes and then the infiltration rate can be brought up a little bit better than that. But gosh, look at this if you have any sort of slope at all. Oh my gosh, it goes way, way down again and so if we're applying water through irrigation faster than the ground could absorb it, then we're losing that water. The evaporation, if it's being a spray, and then through runoff. Now, I'm not saying runoff does not occur from drip irrigation, and many, many times in heavy, heavy clay soil, when you're building your infrastructure, whether, whether that's a parking lot island or a medium, if you use heavy equipment and you don't um, look at the drainage from that parking lot island or that medium, you run your drip irrigation a little bit too long, it literally fills up and goes over, you know, and runs off the curb, so to speak. So we do, we can do that. We can do that. We can be our own worst enemy. So we make, need to make sure when we build our parking lot islands and our mediums and our, and our parkways where the sidewalk and the road are, we need to make sure we, we have that. TCEQ, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, um, makes our irrigation rules for the state. Every city over 20,000 has to adopt these. And so here's an example right here. All new irrigation systems shall utilize, shall not utilize above ground emission devices and landscape that are 48 inches or less and uh, covered on two sides by impervious pavement. So we're talking about sidewalks, we're talking about parking lot islands, we're talking about mediums. Well, if the city that you are in um, cares to up that, like the city of Dallas, they made that 60 inches instead of the 48 inches. And so almost all mediums and parking lot islands and parkways have to be done with your irrigation for new insulation. They did not make it retroactive. The second one we have to look at is the state legislators and, and getting TECQ to write these new rules once water conservation um, 
premier in the state of Texas for irrigation and other uses, and our uses too. But right here then, we say the irrigation system shall be separate zones based on plant material type, microclimate like sun and shade, um, topographic features like our slopes, our soil condition like clay, and then our hydraulic requirements. So in rainwater capture, if you apply this water through drip irrigation, you can do all of that. All of that is about water conservation because in most cases, I mean almost all cases, we're using potable water for um, irrigation. Here we have uh, uh, irrigation system shall not spray water onto impervious surfaces, concrete, asphalt, brick, stones, um, with mortar, walls, and, and fences and sidewalks. And so we know what our irrigation systems do to hardscapes. So they deteriorate, it's very costly, sometimes it creates traffic hazards in the road, sometimes it creates pedestrian hazards on the sidewalk, and of course on asphalt parking lots it will literally tear you know, tear the asphalt up. Homeowners associations, again, um, are going to now, with this new rule, be encouraged to encourage water conservation through rainwater capture, um, landscape design with water conservation in mind, uh, using drought tolerant plants, and uh, according, accordingly turf grass. And so most homeowners associations have a covenant, and in many of those it says, so, so much percentage of your landscape has to be in turf grass, so much of your landscape. Sometimes they actually put one in there, and sometimes that's St. Augustine, which requires quite a bit of water to stay green and healthy. And so they want to encourage homeowners association. We're working with a lot of homeowners associations here in Dallas, Midland, Odessa, um, Austin, you know, Houston in order to get these rules in effect. So on a commercial location, if the rules say that if you have impervious surfaces on two sides, you have to put in drip irrigation. So when you're drawing these, you have to look at all those parking lot islands and those parkways that are required and think in terms of how much drip irrigation can be installed. Then you have to look at the surface area of the parking lot and the building and see if you can talk the customer in to putting a rainwater collection system. A parking lot like this would be ideal to put during the building and you know, planning and building phase to put a rainwater collection system under that parking lot. And there are ways of doing that, very, very affordable ways. When we look at drip irrigation, of course, we have to look at the pros and cons of drip irrigation. And the main one is that we have to know what the components are. So look at this narrow, narrow area here between the city building and where they have their property line where they put this wall. And so their employees are actually going to be walking down this walkway, you know, to get in uh, to the back area where they have their smoking area and they have a picnic table where they can eat lunch out there. Very, very, very nice. And so what are we going to do? We're going to put spray irrigation there that might be hitting the building, spray irrigation that might be hitting that wall, or are we going to be putting drip irrigation? Point source drip irrigation can be used under those shrubberies. And and then inline subsurface drip irrigation can be put under that walkway. Very, very successful. So all the components that go into drip irrigation, pretty much a lot of it is the exact same thing that you're going to be putting in any irrigation system. But what we want to do is look at the advantage of drip irrigation. It works under low pressure. You know, there are ways that you can put this under a lawn. This is a picture of a demonstration we put in for the city of McKinney. We have a pervious sidewalk here, believe it or not, a concrete pervious sidewalk, and then we're going to put drip irrigation under the sod. And you can see I've turned it on. This is right after we got the last connection done. I've turned it on to see that nothing's going to blow apart. We've already prepared the soil. We're going to put the sod over it, and then we're going to wet it down real well and then roll it so the irrigation tubing goes down. We need backflow prevention devices. Oh, I'm going the wrong way, of course. And then we need to decide if we're going to use point source drip irrigation where you apply water exactly under each individual plant. This is great for shrub areas, great for tree areas. Or then are we going to use inline drip irrigation 
irrigation. We have quarter inch, half inch. Uh, tree rings are now required, drip irrigation. Tree rings are required instead of bubblers in the city of Dallas because they they want to do that because it's a better irrigation method, but at the same time, they don't seem to get people to understand that once that tree's established, you can turn off the, <laughs> off the tree zone and, and water with your regular, regular irrigation. And then pressure regulators, of course, drip irrigation works under very low pressure. A lot of that is determined by what type of tubing you're going to use, a manufacturer of that tubing, and they have great, great um, scales and uh, tables that you can use to match that. And then we have to decide if we have an existing irrigation system, are we going to use an adapter like this? Or are we going to use um, a new one and we got all the infrastructure that we need to put in? Screens and filters drip irrigation must be filtered according to all manufacturers. You have a choice of a 100 mesh screen, 150 mesh screen, and 200 mesh screen. We definitely want to do that. With rainwater harvesting, we want to do it before it goes through the pump, and you can do it a little even finer screen after it goes through the pump if you want. We also want an automatic flushing device. If you're going to do a commercial location, there's not going to be any homeowner that's going to go out there and flush this out now and then. Debris does get through the filtering system before it gets to the irrigation. And then also we have a chance that something might be growing in the irrigation tubing, some um, bacteria or some algae. We also want an air release, an automatic air release, and then your flushing device could be something as simple as a ball valve like this if you want it manual instead of not manual. The other thing that I've started recommending, particularly on commercial sites, is uh, this little pop-up indicator that the water is running indicator. You can put it in each zone if you want to because I have a lot of people, they don't see it, it's out of mind, and they're going, is it really running, particularly if it's underground under your sod area or even under mulch? Irrigation controllers for drip irrigation, of course, are the same for any type of irrigation system. Um, newer irrigation controllers, if you don't have a new one, if this is a retrofit, you need to understand that the newer irrigation controllers have a pump you know, right here where you can hook your pump to it. Um, you want to make sure you have seasonal adjustment on there and you want to make sure that you can do cycle and soak irrigation method through there. So drip irrigation. You design and install for a new landscape or convert an existing irrigation system already. Drip irrigation is useful in almost every situation you will run into, and, and particularly parking lot islands like this. It's just ideal way um, to do that. Another parking lot island, you know, covered or uh, you know surrounded with impervious pavements on three sides. This is mainly annuals. There are a few perennials in there, and but how beautiful would that be for you to have that? In, in, in the commercial sites that you're doing. Another parking lot island, again, mainly annuals in here. We have one nice perennial tree. I think in this case it's a crepe myrtle. You also see that part of the parking lot is has pervious pavement in there. In this case, um, manufactured brick-looking, pavestone-looking stuff. And then you can see over here they have uh, concrete. And that might be part of their building code that the, the where the vehicles, the cars park. You can use per, impervious pavement. And then in the other area, they want cement. A lot of pushback of using pervious pavement is because will it drain all the water off on our heavy clay soils? So drip irrigation, you want to work with a licensed irrigator here in the state of Texas. And of course, you can get all those names through. Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, they can design or convert a system, they can install and of course maintain and repair that system. And so how far can I run drip irrigation? This is very confusing to people who don't know about drip irrigation. And what it's going to depend on is your zoning because you want to zone it according to plant water requirements and then the pressure that you're going to put through there. So work with your licensed irrigator to understand how that can be done. And so we're installing a new system here. You can see that in the same trench where we have our main line, we're putting our lateral line, we're putting a riser up above the soil, and then we have our drip irrigation adapter right here. 
And so I like to, no matter how big that zone is, to make it so that it's a loop system. And so you can see we've come up, around, uh, up above ground here, uh, got our adapter, then we put a T in, and then we loop the system, and then we put our uh, sort of grid fashion out. And when we do that, then we have to decide, are we going to want 18 in-spacing on our grid? And that means the holes um, in our drip line are going to be 18 inches apart. They also have 12-inch lines. And so you have to decide that in advance about how large your system is going to be and what that spacing on your drip irrigation. In your valve box, then, what you're going to do is you're going to have your valve, and that needs normal pressure. Then we're going to have our drip irrigation filter, and then our pressure regulators going out um, to our zones. This is at Tarrant County College here in Tarrant County. And this is a five-mile drip irrigation tubing system put in. So each area has its own zone box with its drip irrigation filter. And this case, they're using the 200 mesh drip irrigation filters because they're pumping water out of the lake. And it's all going through that whole area. They're going to be putting beautiful landscaping in there. They have a horticulture department, and they'll help with that. Ground cover bed, you can see it's a very odd shape ground cover. You can see there's a big drain here in the middle for stormwater coming off of this parking lot. So there is an erosion potential. And so adding to it by putting in spray irrigation um, is a little too much. And so having the drip irrigation here. Dallas has made it so the building code says if a business changes hands, you have to upgrade you know, get up to code the electrical, you have to uh, get to code the plumbing, and now they've said the irrigation. So everywhere you drive in the Dallas area, if a business is changing hands, you see the water, the irrigation system being converted from what is usually spray irrigation in parking lot islands to uh, drip irrigation. You can see they're using the tubing to make their loop. They're using the inline tubing. And you can see they're coming four to six inches off that curb. And so in this case, they're using the 12-inch spacing. So the 12-inch spacing all along here to put the water out, and then 12-inch spacing between each row. And so this is real quick and easy to do uh, with T's, but you have to know you're going to do this in advance and measure the site to know exactly Number one, how much irrigation tubing you'll need, and then to make sure you're not going to go over the manufacturer's recommendation for the length of the tubing in that system. This is point source drip irrigation demonstration at a library, and each of these shrubs, every one of these shrubs in the Earthkind Roses is going to have its own dripper on there, and there's big advantages for that because you can supply the exact amount of water through that dripper. The of course, a shrub or the earth kind rose will shade that area where you're putting that water out, and that root, the roots of that plant are going to stay right under there for you. Converting an existing system, so what we did is, is this is a project at one of the county buildings, and what you can see we've done is we've taken one riser, because this is all one big zone, there's no sidewalk or driveway splitting that zone up. If it was, we'd be taking two of the risers, and we're putting the drip irrigation adapter there. And then in this lower picture, what I'm showing is we're capping off all the other um, irrigation sprinkler. What we're doing is not digging a hole and not going down to the riser and putting a half inch cap there. What we're doing is taking the uh, sprinkler cap off and taking the insides of that out and putting this cap on. And that gets it right at ground level, not a lot of digging is required. Again, you have to decide if you want the 18 or the 12 inch spacing here. And so here's what the adapter looks like. It's the same length of your 4-inch um, pop-ups, but instead you're going to take that 4-inch pop-off off, off and you're going to put this adapter on there. There's your filter, uh, 100, 150, 200 mesh filter, whichever you want. And then this right here is a pressure adapter. And so we're going to bring that down anywhere between 15 and 30 PSI in most cases if it's a larger you know, more irrigation tubing is required, you can take that. And then this is where the adapter is. Or, or 
and we're going to take all of those off and cap them off and we're going to go into the valve box if we're going to adapt an existing system or we're going to put in a new system. Um, we go in the valve box and I, I always add an isolation valve and then the drip irrigation filter and then the pressure uh, reducer. And the reason why I want to put the pressure reducer after the filter, you know, the adapters the same way, is because if any debris does get through, we most certainly want, don't want it stopping up that pressure regulator. And then um, we also might want to look at micro irrigation. Micro irrigation and, and point source irrigation uses the different um, types of drippers for point source, and then the micro um, for, you know, coming off one of your one of your main lines. Okay, so if we're converting an existing system, so we're either going to go into the valve box and put our drip irrigation and pressure regulator there, or we're going to go to one of the risers and replace the sprinkler, the 4-inch sprinkler, with our 4-inch adapter. Whichever way we're going to do it, one of the other things I want to stress about rainwater capture is, you know, those odd areas, like I showed you that ground cover bed, you know, it's a great, great way of doing that. And so this is a good selling point for your rainwater capture. Different companies have different type of adapters depending on which type of drip irrigation. We have the barb pieces and then we have the insert. So buy your tubing and all your um, equipment, all your fittings um, at the same time so you know that. Point source drip irrigation, of course, these uh, drippers are pressure regulated and so easily adaptable. This is another adaptation that you can put on a riser in order to do micro irrigation. I don't suggest micro irrigation where there's a lot of walking through and of course you can't do that underground, but you could do that in a shrub bed or a flower bed if, if you would like to. So lots and lots of micro irrigation things. This is of course a research project that we have set up and so we've also added a volume, you know, water meter there and so we can collect the data to know how much water meter. You might want to present that to your customers and they might want to know that exact same thing. Either put the meter where the water's coming out of the cistern or put it at each irrigation zone. Subsurface drip irrigation, this is what makes our lawn areas easily converted to drip irrigation or install a new system. In this case we're doing the lawn's already established and so we're trenching in order to get the drip irrigation um, down into the soil. You want to bury it about four inches and then you want to fill in. And then this is one week after installation. Of course this is summer and it's already growing and this is 90 days. This happens to be zoysia palisades, one of the very drought tolerant grasses that we've developed here at the Dallas Research and Extension Center. There are very, very large commercial um, trenchers that install the tubing at the same time. Of course, this is very, very heavy equipment, so if compaction is a problem, you might want to use a smaller equipment. This is more for a homeowner situation where you're not going to trench a great deal. But these are great advantages that you can use. You need to know the wetting pattern, the difference between point source drip irrigation where it's going to apply it right under the shrub or the tree, in this case an orchard. You need to know what that wetting pattern is for your, your emitters, your drip emitters, or in some cases where you put rings around the tree. So you need to know that wetting pattern. You need to know how much water is going in. Is it going to be 0.6 gallons an hour, 0.9 gallons an hour, 0.5 gallons an hour, 1 gallon an hour? You need to know that capacity and what that's going to do. Then you need to understand about your soil's infiltration and percolation rate. And so you can see the huge, huge difference between how clay soil goes into the ground. It goes in very, very slowly, the pore spaces between the parts of your, you know, Soil particles are very, very small. You want air down there, you want water down there, and you want your plant roots in those pore spaces. So it goes in very, very slowly, 0.1 to 0.4 inches an hour, but it spreads horizontally very, 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 very much. You can see in loam it goes down much quicker. You can see in sand even quicker. And so the spacing of your drippers, the spacing can be very, very wide with clay soil. 
we want to understand that rainwater collection, of course, is non-potable water, and we want everything marked that, both in Spanish and English, and any other language that would be dominant at the site where you're installing all of this. Then maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. You want to manage your irrigation system. And so we need to work with a professional um, irrigator who will come in. You get a contract with them, and they come in monthly during the irrigation and mowing season to check for leaks and clogged tubing, or you want to train your facilities manager. Much, much, much better to get a licensed irrigator in there to do that. And so what you need to understand is the drip tubing can get clogged up, and it also can be um, Use, it can it can get holes in it um, by animals coming in and chewing on it or by um, garden equipment. So when we get a clogged system, of course, we need to get that out of there. And sometimes, if it's a biological, it's agricultural, I mean algae or bacterial slime, sometimes what we're going to have to do is do not just a flushing, but a chlorine treatment. And so in our flushing tubing, we need to be able to unscrew that. We need to know the exact amount of water the tubing holds. And so we can put that chlorine in there and hold that in there for about 20 minutes. Also, particles of sand or silt or clay that can get in your tubing, we need to understand we need to flush those lines out. And this can happen with harvested rainwater. So we need to do as much filtration as possible. And then, of course, we can get chemical clogging with our calcium in our bicarbonate soils and then our, our water and our iron and even fertilizer for using fertilizer injectors in your tubing. So we need flushing. We can do automatic and several of the people who manufacture drip irrigation tubing have great automatic flushing so the first flush that goes through your tube opens that up and flushes that first amount of water out, you know, getting rid of all your calcium and soil particles in there, but it won't get rid of algae or bacteria if that's growing in there. Now, mainly we're concerned with that with um, row crops because we, we, we do a lot of, in, you know, you know, that makes or breaks someone's profit. It won't happen so quickly in a landscape area. Or then we have manuals. This is a cap and this is a crimper. And so we have both opportunities to, to do that. And critter problems. And so we have critter problems and people complain about that. I have been using drip irrigation for 25 years now and I'm going to tell you I've never had a critter problem. And I'm trying to figure out what the difference is between what my landscape is and everyone else's landscape. And the only thing I can think of is my water gardens. And so I have water gardens with excess, you know, the, the raccoons or the gophers or anyone can get water out of my rain gardens. This is a little tiny, tiny um, thing that you can put in any landscape. It, you can put your drip irrigation water, I mean not your drip, your rain, harvested rainwater in there and um, really, really nice amenity to the landscape. As far as your supplies goes, everyone that supplies drip irrigation have wonderful websites with all kinds of tutorials on it, um, with little videos, um, they have booklets that you can download in order to get all the equipment advertised and see how to do all the math in order to figure this out. As far as we go, we have a rainwater harvesting website that you can go to at Texas A&M University. And again, we have lots of pictures, lots of videos. We have a calculator on there. We have some booklets that you can download. And we also have a construction and design book. You have to buy that from the um, Texas A&M AgriLife bookstore, but it's very affordable to do with all the mathematical formulas in it and all the charts you know, for your plumbing codes and for your stormwater uh, codes are in there. We also have Aggie Horticulture. If you want to find out about low uh, <clears throat> water use landscape, we call it Earth Kind Landscaping. Then we have an irrigation um, school of technology at Texas A&M. We have an ET website here in Texas where you get data from all kinds of ET weather stations all across the state of Texas so you can run those formulas. And then we have a turf one so you can find out what are the most water conserving turf. This is the Dallas um, website where the Research and Extension Center are. Now, if you're interested in any kind of certifications, of course, you go through the American Rainwater Catchment System Association uh, for that certification. Texas A&M um, 
we teach that here in the state of Texas, and some of us go to other parts of the, state of, uh, the United States to teach that. And then we have a Texas Rainwater Catchment System Association. Um, its headquarters is in Austin, and their website gives you the capability of finding out who all their members are, and if they're commercial members, it will give you a website that you can go to and see what all kinds of things that they do there. So our whole idea about stormwater protection and irrigation is for us to not allow runoff. Runoff is uh, messing up our surface water, it's messing up our groundwater. And so we want to recharge our groundwater, and the best way to do that is to get the soil to filter that. So if we can apply that water very slowly, or if we have any overflow from our stormwater system, if we could put it in a rain garden where it will slowly infiltrate and percolate down to the groundwater. This is our, our idea. I hope I've given you some ideas you can use in your situation, and I most certainly will answer any question. Please use my email address, and I'll be glad to address those for you. Now, among